Good morning. Welcome to another worship service, Bible Baptist Church. I'd like to say good morning to our guests and family that are worshiping with us via live stream. Good morning to you as well. This is indeed the day that the Lord has made, and may he help us to rejoice today and to be glad in it. Uh, he is worthy of all of our worship. He is worthy of all of our praise. And so what a wonderful, wonderful opportunity that we can come together as brothers and sisters in Christ to celebrate and to worship our God. I just want to give you just a few announcements for prayer. Uh, we have members who are sick and uh, we need to be in prayer for Deacon Carter and his son Nick. Remember Deacon Carter, his son Nick, they are in need of our prayer today. Spoke with Sister Lynette White. She's asking us to remember her mom in prayer, Sister Bessie White. And also we need to remember Sister Catherine Bodley also in prayer today in the days ahead. And uh, she's here uh, but uh, we need to pray for our sister Barron as well. So good to see her today. Uh, but uh, we need to remember her and pray for her health and for her strength. We had a young lady who, a uh, student at Western, and uh, she was here, we visit every Sunday, uh, Micah Clark. I don't know if you remember her, but she was in the aviation at Western, and I had a chance to speak with her uh, yesterday, uh, quite a lengthy conversation, and uh, she wanted us to know that she appreciates all of our prayers for her. Uh, next month, uh, she will be uh, Captain uh, Michael Clark for uh, Delta Airlines, and so we Appreciate her and uh, hopefully uh, you'll be hearing from her in the future uh, but uh, continue to keep her in prayer she's doing some amazing amazing things and uh, holding on to the Lord and um, you know just allowing what she's doing for his glory for his honor and for his praise I also like to thank uh, Minister Sims for last week uh, bringing the message of the gospel to us and uh, thank you my brother Appreciate you so much. Yes, thank you. And we had a chance. Thank you for your prayers as we traveled. Uh, we got a chance. You've seen uh, Michael Sharpley and uh, Vernon Timmons. We didn't get a chance to see Vernon Timmons, but we've been praying for George Jones and Michael Sharpley, uh, Marion's youngest brother, our brother-in-law, George Jones, and we had a chance to... Uh, be with both of them uh, during our weekend. And I'm also asking you to pray for my mom, uh, for her. She had a fall this week. And uh, just remember mom in prayer uh, for healing and also for strength. And then wisdom for Marianne and I as well. Keep mom, Bernice Lavender, in prayer. You know, Carter G. Woodson a historian who has written some excellent, excellent books, uh, Miseducation of the Negro and several others, but he's primarily the one responsible for what we celebrate as uh, Black History or African American History Month. Uh, he never intended for the celebration to be isolated and apart from uh, American history. Uh, the goal was, however, to be able to make sure that our story was told and that it was included in history. And so initially a week of the year, which is now a month in the year, but again, not to isolate, but to include the story. 
because there were so many African-American uh, men and women who not only uh, built this country, uh, but also uh, contributed, uh, show tremendous patriotism in uh, Revolutionary War, Civil War, all the wars, and to not have the story included. And so it's because of all of that that has brought us to this month. Uh, but again, let's not treat it as February and then when February is over, the story is over. No, it was all for the purposes of making sure that the story is told, that the heroes and sheroes are celebrated just like we do others in our history. And so our deacon Herbert is going to come, James Weldon Johnson, Rosamond Johnson, in honor of Abraham Lincoln's birthday, decided that they would compose a song. And the song is lift every voice and sing. And so we'll be singing that each Sunday uh, for the month of February in honor of their contributions and the contributions of others and the history and the story. And so let's all stand as Deacon Herbert comes. 477.
And you may be seated. Matthew's Gospel, in chapter 26. Verses 26 through 29. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and he blessed it. He broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and he gave thanks and gave it to them saying drink ye all of it for this is my blood of the new testament which is shed for many for the remission of sins but I say to you I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom Jesus took bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it and said, this is my body. Let's reflect on the body of Jesus as we all eat together. Jesus said, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Without the shedding of blood, there could be no forgiveness of our sins. Let's reflect on the blood of Jesus as we all drink together. Father, thank you for your grace and your mercy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At this time, Minister Sims is going to come and lead us in prayer, followed by Brother Charles Clark. bow our head for a word of prayer our father father of our lord and savior jesus christ lord we thank you for today a day that we have never seen before truly lord a day that we will never see again we thank you for our life our health our strength we thank you for the use and activities of our limbs Lord, we thank you, Lord, because you said in your word that through you we live, we move, we have our being, and your grace is sufficient for us. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God, and besides you, there is none else. Lord, we can't move without you. We can't think without you. We wouldn't even be existence, Lord, without you, Lord. For that, we want to say thank you. Thank you for being so mindful of us, Lord. We thank you for giving us free will, Heavenly Father. Lord, we thank you for waking us up this morning. You clothed us in our right minds. You put clothes on our backs. You put shoes on our feet, giving us a mind to come out to your house of worship just one more time, just to sing Zion songs and to praise your holy and righteous name, knowing that your name alone is worthy to be praised you said in your word lord from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same let everything that have breath praise the lord so lord we serve you lord not because we've been so good not because we've always did or said the right thing but we serve you just because you are god and you are more than worthy of our praise you are worthy of more than our adoration 
So, Lord, what shall we render unto God? For all your benefits that you have bestowed upon us, Lord, for that we want to say thank you. Lord, we thank you for your Holy Spirit, Lord, that indwells and that encamps us, Heavenly Father. We thank you for your word, Lord, that it is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway. For that, we want to say thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that our hearts beating at the proper time and the blood is running warm through our veins, Lord. We want to say thank you. For you touched us with your finger of love last night, Heavenly Father. When we didn't even know that we was even in the world, Lord, you kept us. You kept the thief and robber out of our home, Heavenly Father. You kept us from seeing and unseen danger, Lord. For that, we want to say thank you, Lord. So we come to you, Lord, with a bowed down head and a heavy heart. We come to you as an empty pitcher before ever flowing fountain, asking you to have mercy on our much needed souls. Lord, we come asking you, Lord, uh, to forgive us of our sins. For you said in your word, Lord, that we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from us uh, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, you said in your word to create in us a clean heart, O God, and renew within us the right spirit. Cast not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit, but, but restore unto us the joy of thy salvation and uphold us with thy free spirit. Then will we be able to teach transgressors thy ways, the sinners shall be converted unto you. So, Lord, we love you, Heavenly Father. Lord, we praise you. Lord, that, there's a psalmist that say, Lord, I don't know why that you love us. I don't know why that you care. I don't know why you sacrificed your life. Oh, but I'm so glad that you did. And we only love you because you first loved us. Lord, you loved us so much that you gave your only begotten son, Heavenly Father, that you took a beating on the cross one night all night long, Heavenly Father. Lord, you let them put you in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights, but early on the third day morning, you got up with all power of heaven and earth is in your hands. So, Lord, we thank you, even for this church body at large. Lord, bind us up in love, Heavenly Father, that one can't fall without the other. Lord, bring us closer in love. Help us to check up on one another, Heavenly Father. Lord, we live in imperilous times where men are becoming lovers of themselves. Love and pleasure, Lord, more than they love God. Help us also, Lord, not to fall in that same condemnation, Lord. Help us to seek you and only you, Heavenly Father. Lord, we come praying for our pastor, Pastor Lavender and his family. Continue to strengthen him when he is weak. Build him up when he is torn down. Prop him up on every leaning side, Heavenly Father. Even this morning, Lord, guide his heart, guide his mind, guide his ears, guide his understanding, Lord, that he may open up these holy scriptures and say what thus said the Lord. Heavenly Father, if there's anybody listening on the live stream, anyone in this building, Lord, that does not know you as Lord and Savior, Lord, you said that if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So, Lord, we love you. We praise you. We be careful to give you all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hill the guilty pair bow 
all down with care. God sent his son to win his erring child. He reconciled and pardoned from his sin. years of time have passed away when earthly thrones and kingdoms fall when men who hear refuse to pray on rocks and hills and mountains call God's love so sure shall still endure all measureless and strong redeem The saints and angels song. Oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and shall forevermore endure the saints and angels so could we with ink the ocean fear and were the skies of parchment made were every star on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry. Those stretched from sky to sky.
Thank you, Brother Clark. That brother been singing that song for a long time. He was singing it before I came here. It just really ministers that truth of the love of God. Thank you. It's just bless. Brother Terrence, Brother Holloway, thank you so much. Let's take our Bibles this morning. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 8. I want us to consider the parable of the sower. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 8. The parable of the sower. I'm going to read just verse 4. And when much people were gathered together and were come to him out of every city, he spake by a parable. When we consider the matter of parables and Jesus speaking, we need to consider an allegorical or story that represents something real in life to teach a moral or to give moral instruction. An allegorical or story that represents something in real life for the purpose of teaching or giving moral instruction. Jesus spoke many parables. Many of the parables and stories come from lessons from agriculture or the product from the soil. You recall in the gospel, excuse me, in 1 Corinthians 15, where the apostle Paul would use the matter of the seed going into the ground to illustrate his own death and how that which is alive must first die in reference to the seed. You can think of the Apostle Paul in Galatians 6 where he is teaching us that life is a field. And when I come to my life and I look back, what have I planted? He says, be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. And so generally, in the context of uh, warning someone of their behavior, we have said, you're going to reap what you sow. But really, the context is referring to you and I doing that which is good when we have opportunity and that we should not faint in doing that because we're we're going to reap if we faint not. But here again, a moral lesson from agriculture. In chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians, another one about the unity of ministry, how he says that one plants and someone comes along and waters, but, but it's God who gives the increase to illustrate to us the unity of, of ministry and how we, we work together. And that God ultimately is the one who can bring the increase from the soil. 
And then in 2 Corinthians in 8 and 9 about the blessings of giving and how we are blessed, he says, he that, that giveth sparingly will reap sparingly, but he that giveth bountifully will reap bountifully a lesson in giving. And then finally, we see this before us this morning, the lesson from agriculture about the seed being the word of God. The seed being the word of God. Like gold, our lives will be tried. They will be tested in the areas of our health, our wealth, and our families. These trials help us to see where we are spiritually. And certainly the text this morning about where I am when it comes to the word of God in my life. I have to be tested, I have to be tried to see and separate the gold from the dross in my life. So we come then to the parable of the sower. In verses 4 through 8 we see the parable and then we're going to look at the interpretation of the parable that Jesus gives. Starting at verse 4, and when much people were gathered together and were come to him out of every city, he spake by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. Some fell upon a rock. And as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. And others fell on good ground and sprang up and bare fruit a hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. His disciples asked him, saying, What might the parable be? And he said, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables, that seeing they might not see, and hearing they might not understand. There are four kinds of seed or soils that we need to look at. The devoured seed, the withered seed, the choked seed, and the fruit-bearing seed. God will use this lesson in agriculture as a parable to teach us a valuable life moral lesson. It shows where we are spiritually based upon the trials or the events that happen in my life. First of all, he says that the meaning of these parables are to illustrate the mysteries of the kingdom of God, that these are mysteries and therefore they have to be revealed. They are not going to come by way of intuitive knowledge. And so I'm speaking to you a mystery in a parable Because those who want to get this knowledge intuitively, they would just simply be hearing, but they won't understand. They would be listening, you see, and uh, they will not be able to see it because it is a mystery. But to you, I'm going to speak to you in parables, he says. These stories that illustrate truth to teach and give moral instruction. The first thing that Jesus says that in this story, the devoured seed, this seed that fell by the wayside. Verse 11, he says that the seed, now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. 
those by the wayside are they that hear. Then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Jesus says that as the sower went forth to sow, some of the seed fell by the wayside. And this wayside seed, as it fell, the devil came and he devoured that seed. He says these are those who have heard the word of God. They have heard it in their hearts. But the devil came and he stole it. He took it away. I personally believe that this is what has happened to many of our children. That we had them in all the right places. We had them in Sunday school and vacation Bible schools. And we had them in all kinds of places where the word of God was given. But somehow Satan came and he stole that word. He took that word out of their hearts. How does he do that? How is, pray for me, how does he, how does he do that? How is he able to, to take the word of God away from the hearts of people? Does he actually open that heart up and, and take it out? No, I believe it is from additional information that is given. We see it in the Garden of Eden that that there will be knowledge given, but knowledge given doesn't always represent the truth that is given. And so Adam and Eve had heard the word of God, and as with that word came tremendous liberty to live, that of all of the trees of the garden you may freely eat, but that tree that is in the midst of the garden in the day you eat of that tree, you will surely die. But some new knowledge came. And that new knowledge came that you can go ahead and eat of the tree of knowledge. You see, you shall not surely die. God knows that if you eat of the tree, you see, you will be as God, knowing, knowing good and evil. You see, the additional knowledge was a lie. It also was knowledge that caused them to question the very character of God. And once you believe that his word is a lie now and you question the very character of God, you see, then they were left with a decision now, not based on the word of God, because now that word has been taken away from your heart. What is now there is the new knowledge that has been given you by the devil. And so you make a decision based on that knowledge. And so when you see that the tree was good for food, it was good to the eye, it was good to, to make one wise, then we ate of that tree. And even though it doesn't say what kind of fruit it is, I don't think it is any mistake that the representation logo for apple is a bitten piece of fruit because it simply says this, what we're presenting through this is the new knowledge that we're giving to you. And if you discover that the goal is to keep us engaged and to get the data and the information. So we're so engaged that, that, that I don't have time for reflection of all of this new knowledge that I'm being bombarded with 24 hours a day onward, more and more and more and more information is coming into me. So much and so that 
I don't have time to reflect. I'm so engaged in, in, in the technology. I'm, I'm so engaged that, that I'm forgetting that, that I need time to sit down at Jesus' feet. Mary and Martha, you're so busy and so active, but Mary has chose the good part. She's sitting at the feet. The goal is more than teaching from a standing position. The goal is to sitting down in a circle where the instructor would be sitting, identifying with the people that they're teaching, and, and perhaps legs folded, and you would say that I'm submitting, I'm sitting at your feet. I am your disciple. I, I am learning I'm finding that it is difficult to find time to sit and reflect upon all of the information that I'm, I'm hearing. I need time to be able to pull down the strongholds of my mind. I need time to be able to cast down imaginations. I need time to be able to bring every thought into the obedience of Christ. I need time to have a readiness to punish the disobedience of the information that I'm hearing. But what in fact happens is that this new knowledge comes in. And it starts to take away from the word of God that I've heard. It has simply fallen by the wayside. And I am forgetting that I'm either being conformed to the world or I'm being transformed by the renewing of my mind. I need to remember that Satan is the one where Paul says that if my gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine upon them. He puts the blinders on through additional knowledge. And in doing so, he, he has this ability to take away. Because the seed is simply, I heard it. But it fell. It fell by the wayside. It was devoured. The second thing that we see is not only the devoured seed, but we also see the withered seed. Verse 13, they on the rock are they which when they hear receive the word with joy. And these have no root which for a while believe and in time of temptation they fall away. You see this withered seed to those of the seed that the sower planted and some of them fell by the wayside, and some of them fell among the rocks. These people hear the word of God. They receive it with joy, but the word, the seeds, don't take up root. And so as soon as trials come, as soon as difficulties in life come, as soon as temptations come, these people fall away. They've heard the word, they received it with joy, but it never took up root. And so when trials come, they fall away. I think this is what is happening to us right now with our current state where where all of us are experiencing trials of health and wealth and family. We all have had family members who have been sick these last couple of years. Some have died. This has had an impact upon our wealth, our health. 
We're primarily trying to, to protect ourselves and to be safe. And, and it's starting to take a mental toil upon all of us. People in the hospitals, frontliners, and school teachers, and those individuals, the mental health of what's going on. I'm forgetting that Jesus talked about this in his parable of the builders and how life is about building a house. And either I'm going to build my house on a rock or I'm going to build my house on the sand. But whether I build my house on the rock or I built my house on the sand, one thing I can guarantee is that the storm is coming to my house. It's coming. So the parable is not, let me show you how to prevent the storm from coming to the house. The parable is, I'm going to show you how the house can stay standing in the midst of the storm. He that heareth my word, and doeth it. I'm going to liken him unto a man that built his house upon the rock. And when the winds and the waves came and beat upon the house, the house stood. Because, you see, it was planted upon the rock. The people are falling away simply because the fact that they heard the word, they, they received it with joy, but they didn't get to the place where they meditated upon the word so that the word of God can be rooted and grounded. It only happens by doing it, not just hearing it, not just receiving it, but by doing it. Psalm 1, blessed is the man, you see. It talks about that his life, you see, his joy will be in the word of God. And in this word doth he meditate upon it day and night. That man that meditates upon that word day and night, he says, he will be like a tree planted by the rivers of waters. It will bring forth fruit in its season, the leaf will not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Why? Because he just didn't hear the word of God. He meditated upon it, which means to, to take it into life's experience. The writer of Hebrews in chapter 5 talks about the gymnasium of our spiritual exercise of of exercising the word of God into life's experience so that I will be able to discern good and evil. Hebrews chapter 5, you see. The whole idea is, is that I am a doer. I have to be a, a practitioner of the word of God. Think about it. Think about all the sermons that we've heard. Think about all of the Bible conferences we've gone to all the radio programs that we've listened to, the thousands of sermons and Bible lessons that we've been engaged in. But if I don't decide that I'm going to be a doer of what I'm hearing, then I'll just be a hearer. And as soon as trials of life come, I'm going to fall away. I'm going to fall away. It's not the fact that I won't experience the storm, but I'll be able to live life. I will be able to live in the storm because my feet are solid and I am grounded and I am, I am rooted in God's word. He says, Jesus says that this, this is the withered seed. But not only do we see the devoured seed and the withered seed, there's the choked seed. Verse 14 says, and that which fell among the thorns. 
Are they which when they have heard go forth and are choked with the cares and the riches and the pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection? And some of the seed, he says, fell by the wayside. It was devoured. Some of the seed fell upon the rocks. And because it didn't have root, it, it withered away. But some of, the, some of the seed, it fell in the soil. It began to grow. But then there was also these thorns that came and choked the growth. Jesus says that choking with the growth is the cares, the affairs, the riches, and the pleasures of life, and how they tend to distract me and distract you. Now, there's so many passages that give instructions to those who are rich. So the Bible is not opposed to riches. There are some wealthy people like Joseph of Arimathea who will have the wealth to be able to get the job done. Somebody had to have the, the political and the financial influence to be able to go to Pilate and say, give me the body. I've already bore a tomb for it. You see. And uh, Paul is writing to Timothy, and he gives in chapter 6 instruction to, to the wealthy. But what has to be remembered with wealth is that wealth is uncertain. Paul says to Timothy, speak to those who are rich in the church and, and remind them where, where the wealth comes from and remind them that the wealth is uncertain. That I can't set my affection on it. I can't just give my life and it be my total focus because Matthew, in writing about the parable of the sower, he calls the riches deceitful. And they're deceitful because they never satisfy. I can remember, I told the story before, I remember the first time we bought our first, our first brand new automobile. Now, all in high school, I was waiting on this day and I thought that I could, I could see myself in my sports car. I could literally see it. I could envision it. But it just so happens that at the time that I got ready and had the finances to get my, my, my brand new car, I had four kids. Six of us. So I had to go get an Econoline van. Went on the showroom and saw one two-tone gray. Y'all might remember that. Tarantines had two-tone blue. Marshall Waller, two-tone brown. I said, that gray is it. Until I pulled up to the light and I saw this two-tone beige. I said, I should have got that beige one. Things never satisfy. We build houses. But then we go to open houses to see all the stuff that we didn't build with. Things were never meant to satisfy. Solomon teaches us that in the book of Ecclesiastes. I have to understand that they're uncertain. I have to understand that this wealth is never meant to satisfy my soul. But if I don't, I'm going to be chasing a fake rabbit all of my life, and I will spend all of my time focusing upon the wealth and forgetting, you see, the Word of God and how I have to build this Word of God into my life for my spiritual stability. I'll be chasing a fake rabbit. You see that with cryptocurrency and bitcoins. Today, I'm wealthy. Tomorrow, I'm poor. 
The next day I'm wealthy. And then I'm poor. It's uncertain. Nothing wrong with investing and building wealth. Dave Ramsey talks about this. Hold on to more of your wealth. But I have to understand, as the Lord says, what is the profit if I gain the whole world and lose my own soul? What will a man give in exchange for his soul? And Then who shall those things be that you have provided for? There's nothing as valuable as a soul. So in this life, I can't then spend all of my time focusing because it will distract me. It will choke the word of God. And he says there are many, many, Jesus says, that have fallen away. Because they're so focused on the cares of the world. I can't come because. I can't do this because. My house, my car, my money. So he said it's hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Not speaking against wealth for those Christians that are rich. I just have to realize it's uncertain. It comes from God, and He has given me a mandate that I need to be rich in God. I need to be rich in heavenly things, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, where thief can't break in and steal it. He said it chokes. And finally, the fourth fruit, the fourth seed, fruit-bearing seed. Verse 15, but that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, they keep it. And they bring forth fruit with patience. Some of the seed, you see, fell by the wayside. Some of it fell among the, st the, the stones, and some of it fell in the ground, but it was choked because of the thorn, and some of it fell in good ground. That good ground seed, you see, grew and produced fruit. Now, what is the fruit? Fruit is produce. And so what does it do? It produces what's in the seed. And what is the seed? The seed is the word of God. So a productive life then is that life where the word of God falls into the good soil of my soul, my heart, germinates to the point where not only I'm hearing it and reading it, he says, I am keeping it. In other words, I'm going to do it. And as I do it, it becomes my life, and I begin to produce the very seed that is planted. Hundredfold, tenfold, twentyfold. My life then is a life that is producing the Word of God in my marriage, in my family, on my job, in my church, everything. I am producing. The word of God. Why? Because that seed has fallen in good ground. I believe that Jesus is speaking to us today that this situation, these last two years, really helped me and they will help you to see where you are, where I am when it comes to the word of God that I've been listening to that I've been hearing that the situations with the devil, the situations, you see, with, with the uh, riches of life, how do I handle trials in my life when they come? When difficulties come, am I able to stand? Where am I at right now? Some of the people are really sick today. 
And I thank God for our medical ministry who's done everything to keep everybody safe. And it's been Jehovah Rapha who is healing. Ultimately, it's not the medical ministry, but I thank God for the instruction. People have to take precaution. If they have some pre-existing illnesses, we believe all of that. But I want to tell you that some of the people are simply using COVID as an excuse for not serving, for not giving, for not attending. Seems as though the only place you can get it is in the church because you sure can't get it at Costco. Can't get it at Myers. See people all in the store. More people in there than in church. And they ain't got masks on. This is a Rev, I'm coming. I, I'm just not comfortable yet. What are you? I'm, I'm looking around. What? It's just, it's just, it's just trial. We, we, we couldn't plan for this. We didn't know what to do. And yet, where do I stand? That is here now. Even my own preaching, I thought about. I understand more what Paul says to be instant in season and out of season. I'm so comfortable behind what we would call the sacred desk. But the two years have removed me from this place. To my living room, to, 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 to outdoors, inside, back out, back home, virtual, in person, virtual, in person, virtual. But I've asked the Lord, whatever the, the place, I want to be faithful the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't need to be here to worship. I can worship at home. Praise God for that. He's omnipresent. But he does tell us that we can't get into this pattern of forsaking the assembling together of believers. And the lack of the Lord's table comes with sickness and death warning. Peter says, we don't ever want to get to the place, even if I choose to stay at home, I don't ever want to get to the place where Peter says that it becomes common that I don't honor the Lord and his sacrifice. He said, this do in remembrance of me. So I'm hoping that even this morning, those who are home will still honor the Lord because he sees it if you're at your house yes it's in your heart so may God help us help me help us to look at this seed and to strive to allow the seed of the word of God to fall on good ground so I want to be a hearer a reader, but a doer. I want to commit to keeping it because now I can exercise it. Now I can be that tree planted by the rivers of waters that will bring forth the fruit in its season that the leaf will not wither and whatsoever we do will prosper. Father, we thank you so much for the word of God. We thank you for the parable of the sower. That this allegory, this story, heavenly story, kingdom story, mystery, has a real life meaning. It's moral instruction for all of us. And I'm asking first that you might help the preacher. Help me, Father. 
But as Paul says, I don't want to preach to others and become a castaway. And so I want to submit to your word this morning. That as I teach it, as I preach it, I am a sore. And so help me, Lord, not to, to be satisfied with some of the seed just, just falling by the wayside. falling on stones falling among thorns help our preaching and our teaching ministry to be that which is intentional to provide understanding depthness and so that people can, can chew on it and eat it digest it the Spirit of God take it into their spirit, their very soul. The same for our children and grandchildren. Not enough just to have them in a place where they hear it. But we must be examples of, of practicing the Word of God in everyday life. So help me and help my wife and help my family help my church family to be practitioners of your word. Help us to be grounded in good ground, your word, your seed, that we might be fruit bearers in our life. And I pray this by God's grace. While every head is bowed, every eye closed, there might be someone here today or listening that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior. We thank you, Lord, for the profoundness but the simplicity of the gospel, that Jesus would die, was buried, and rose again. And faith and belief in that, you said, Paul says, by this we are saved. So I'm asking, Father, for salvation for that soul that is seeking you right now. Is with the heart that man believeth unto righteousness, is with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And so we pray. There might be someone, Father, who is already saved and, and, and wanting to commit their life to service to you. Maybe there's someone that would like that that's not a part of this family that would like to become a part. We send the invitation to you today. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Let us all stand. again from the dead, our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever, and the people of God said, God bless you.